Hello and welcome. I'm Dorothea. I'm one of the owners here. I'm so happy to see you in our shared space and all of you who are logging in online. Um, uncertain times that have these waves of extra uncertainty, and we're in one of those. I got a bunch of emails today from people who I thought they'd be here and then decided to be more comfortable online. It's lucky that we have that option, but it still feels really special um, to have friends back in our space. Um, so uh, that's that's great, and it's a it's an evening of, of talking about theater and all things theater, which happens only in shared space. So um, yeah. uh, this is. It's good that we can do it both ways. Um, this is our last event of the year before we take a break in order to um, uh, celebrate the holidays and then do the course books for the university. So we resume uh, in events at the end of February and are looking forward to a lot of exciting stuff. If you would like to be on our newsletter and you aren't, uh, just check the box next to where you signed in and we'll add you to that list. Um, before introducing our guests, a couple of quick housekeeping things. We will, of course, leave time for a QA, and a um, and that will also include questions from the online audience. If you have a question and you're online, please just find the Q&A button, ask a question button, rather, um, at the bottom of your screen, and uh, put your question in there. We're going to keep an eye on that. And for those of you here, I want to thank you for wearing your mask and for keeping those on. And then um, if you have a question, I'll come to you with the mic, and then for that, you can take the, the mask off so that we can everyone can hear you clearly. Um, so that's that. Also, tonight's event is a collaboration with the McCarter Theater, um, our friends over there. And uh, so many thanks to everyone who helped us get word out um, over at McCarter. But now I'm delighted uh, to, and honored to welcome Alexis Green and Emily Mann. Alexis is the author and editor of numerous books about theater, including The Lion King, Pride Rock on Broadway, written with Julie Tamer, and the biography of Lucille Wartell, The Queen of Off Broadway. Alexis is also an actor, a theater critic, and a teacher. She was a co founder and first president of Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas. We regularly have authors here um, who talk about their memoirs and other authors who talk about biographies they've written, but I think it's the first time that we actually have the subject of a biography <laughs> and the author of a biography. So that's a first, and it's great. Um, so Emily Mann is, of course, the celebrated and decorated playwright, director, and for 30 years, uh, the artistic director, as well as uh, playwright in residence of Christie's own McCarter Theater. I won't list her many honors or her many plays that she wrote and directed. I'm sure we will um, revisit several of those in the next hour that we have together. And I say all of this knowing full well that actually in this room, um, in this shared virtual and real space, for most of you, Emily Mann needs no introduction. And yet, we are here because thanks to Alexis Green and her splendid new biography of Emily, those who may know Emily from one or another part of her life get to encounter her in the full art of that life. And those who may have seen one or the other of her many plays, either in Carter or elsewhere, get to see the extraordinary range of her always radical work. All of us get to understand better and more fully, thanks to this lucid biography, the profound ways in which Emily's political commitments work through and help us grapple with American calamities and injustices on the stage in place for which she first had to invent a genre, the genre of theater of testimony. Alexis quotes Emily, and uh, I'll step away in a second, uh, reflecting on her teenage years at the lab school in Chicago in the late 60s. And I quote, I would have been out in the street, but I wasn't. I was in the theater. Luckily for us and for American theater history, the theater remained Emily Street, though it also became so much more than that. Laboratory, classroom, and finally with her play Gloria Alive, listening circle, and that's only for starters. Luckily, too, for us and for American theater, Alexis has now told that fuller story. Please join me in welcoming them both. I think that uh, I speak for both of us uh, to thank you for having us here this evening. Uh, 
of it's, and also many thanks to Debbie and Mike and Sarah uh, at McCarter who uh, helped to put this together. Uh, we're delighted to be here. Uh, here we are again. <laughs> um, so one of my first questions, I don't know if it's a question, was people have asked me, you know, what did I discover among the memories that you've talked about and that you talked about that particularly delighted me? And I always come back to your encounter when you were first here in uh, Princeton and first at the McCarter. Your encounter with the Nassau Club. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, um, rather than having me tell about that, I'm going to hand it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My good friends know this story because um, I I enjoy telling it a lot, and I am sure that Sarah Rasmussen has found a very different Princeton than I found 30 years ago, or I certainly hope so. Um, <laughs> this was 1990, July of 1990, and I had just arrived in Princeton. I'm looking at Bob Durkee because he was he was witness to much of this, as was Wendy eventually early, uh, a little bit later on. But I'm looking at all, this is like a homecoming. Looking at, <laughs> for those of you who are online, I, I'm looking at some of my oldest and best friends in the audience right now, and they all went through this with me. But when I first arrived in July of 1990, um, I didn't really understand what Princeton was, but I was quickly learned. Um, and one of the key moments was I had been asked to speak to the Rotary Club at the Nassau. What the Nassau Club was? Grace, were you with me then? A year before. A year before. Okay. So I arrived with my. I had at that time was still writing out all of my speeches, and I had worked very hard on this. I was to talk about my vision for um, the McCarter Theater now that I had arrived. And um, a man who had a distinctly sour smell uh, <laughs> me in front of this down at the bottom of the steps of the NASA club and said, well, how nice you've arrived. Let's go around back. And I said, why would I go around back? Oh, women cannot go through the front door unless they're on the arm of their husband, who is a member. So let's go around that. And I said, oh no. I don't do the back. I said, but but you're speaking. I said, yes. If you want me to speak, I'm going through the front door. And he hemmed and hawed and raised his foul. And then we broke into us, but they go, What will I do? And, and um, I just want to tell you, I went through the front door. <laughs> and, and it seems to me that, in a way, that not in a way, but that has, for me, been a, a metaphor for your career. You've always gone through the front door. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. I don't always feel like I'm going through the front door. Or that I, well, maybe I'm banging on that front door. Well, like, yeah. yeah. banging and, and eventually going through it. Right. And eventually. You know, and uh, it's a metaphor for, for women as well. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. In the theater and, and beyond the theater. Yes. Can we talk a little bit about your first couple of years? here as uh, artistic director of the McCarter. What were some of the challenges? Okay. Well, the first, well, that you heard one. Um, two. One of the key challenges is when I arrived, um, I didn't realize what terrible financial straits the theater was in. And they were in terrible financial straits. Plus, the Arts Council had been cut in half that month that I arrived. Really welcome to New Jersey. I mean, it really was an astounding situation. 
And I had a very, um, I had made it clear and the, and the, the uh, search committee who had asked me to come, I said to them, you know, I'm going to be doing hard hitting political work. It's gonna be about women and people of color. I do a lot of political work and I love the classics. Can you handle all that? And they said, yes. Um, but they didn't really get it. <laughs> and um, so here I was putting on stage, I think only the second uh, play written by a, or an African American, certainly, but probably a person of color completely, um, by doing the uh, musical Betsy Brown with Ndizaki Shange and I co-authoring the book and lyrics and by Katie Carroll writing um, music. And it was a rhythm and blues um, musical, all black cast. And a lot of people didn't know what to do with it. And, and um, on top of that, Ndizaki decided that she didn't want to go with the Broadway producer that was a very eminent Broadway producer who wanted to go with us. She decided that she would only have a black producer and this guy who uh, promised something like a half million dollars to enhance the project ran off with the money. Oh, right. Yes. So we were <laughs> so <laughs> low, 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 low. hemorrhaging money. We really needed, uh, we, we, we needed um, traumatic care. Um, I also had a dear guy who had been promoted from being the head of the shop to, or oh, his production manager, um, head of the shop, then production manager, and then was made managing director and had never done a contract for a major artist. And that was hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there I was thinking, where am I? And every party I went to, I found veiled anti Semitic comments that weren't so veiled because they didn't know I was Jewish. And the law, they were calling me like I was German. <laughs> but of course, if they knew anything about Germany, they would know that that name, right? I don't know what they um, but anyway, so I heard all kinds. I thought, where have I moved? I got a very uh, interesting high up official in the uh, Princeton administration who will remain nameless said to me, I just don't understand how any white person could have a relationship with a black person. I said this to me at a party at, you were with me, Joyce, at Sally, <laughs> Sally and Jerry's house. And I, I, <laughs> I really thought I was going to pass out. I mean, I just had such a sense of doom. And I had arrived as a single mother, and this was had to work. It just had to work. And so the when you ask what was the first year like, it's so fraught with the emotion of it, the conservatism and bigotry of Princeton at that time. Um, and I think that the finances of the theater compounded with that made me think, how can we possibly make this work? Oh, you did. I, I, yes, <laughs> yes, the yeah, good you news did. is yes. it worked. And you know, there I was thinking I came for three to five years and 30 years later, I'm still here, 32 years later, I'm still here. So we made it work, but the challenges were immense. Well, one of the wonderful things I think that you made work happened in 2003 when the Berlin Theater opened. Ah, yes. uh, and you directed the first production there, which was uh, Milo Cruz's and in the tropics. Why did you want an additional theater? I said that from the moment I interviewed for the job. <laughs> if anyone has seen the Matthews Theater, um, you know that it is a bear of a space. I grew to adore it and learned how to work with it, but it's it was acoustically very tricky. It was way too wide, flat, and um, actually visually, you often wanted to be in the balcony because if you were looking up some nice from what we call the gully, you couldn't actually see um, what was on the stage in the middle of the auditorium. So it was a tricky house. It was uh, over a thousand seats. 
And if you want to do new work and if you want to do cutting edge work, sometimes you need a smaller space to make that pop. And so I said, I will come if you can say that we'll have a, a small theater, um, which I would like to be at the second main stage, not a second stage where you know you put all the stuff you think no one wants to see, but actually a thriving uh, uh, second main stage it, within three to five years. So they didn't quite make it. <laughs> <laughs> but I no, I but it, 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 it yeah. is a, a, a beautiful stage, a beautiful oh, additional stage, and not a, not a second stage. In stage. fact, once it was built, I very rarely went back to the main stage. Right. And then when I did, I realized how I actually love it. But it was such a relief after, what, 14 years. So now that we've talked about some of the challenges that you faced, looking back at the 30 years, what do you think about most fondly? I had the most fantastic staff when I was here. Uh, the shops were the best in the country. Uh, I got to write. 14 or 15 plays or adaptations and direct. I don't know, Cheryl might know. She always knows the numbers. No, I don't over direct. 50, over 50. Over 50 productions. So I was constantly engaged in creating with people I adored and who helped me grow and challenged me in every way. Um, and I hope I challenge them as well. We got to do work in the community that just I'm so proud of um, with our education department and go out and research and I did. She and I did amazing, amazing work with um, working with the community, going into the schools. Um, and then also with all the African American work, the Black community in Princeton was. Um, a pillar for me. They just held me up. When I was, when I hit any kind of levels of despair, they were there for me. Um, I did work for them, about them, and, um, and even when my father died, I, I went into the Black Church with him. I, I, that's where I got most of my own degree. Thank you. It's interesting that you mentioned the shop, because I don't know if many people know, but originally, shop at the Matthews was underneath the stage. <laughs> yes, before my Which time though. <laughs> rather <laughs> remarkable, it seems to me that that could have occurred. But okay. <laughs> um, I know, I know. So I began writing this in 2014, the biography, Emily Mann, a rebel artist of the American theater. And we sat across from each other as I've said in a couple of other circumstances, you really joined me in this endeavor, you participated. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if, if Amanda Bliss is here, who was the, who she's sick, she sends her love, she, she can't come tonight. She's, oh dear, nursing herself and her child. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. But uh, Amanda was the, was Emily's executive assistant and managed to, you know, set up meetings for us at least an hour and a half every two weeks, which was really remarkable. Is that what we did? We, how, we, we did that. We really did that. Oh my gosh. So, did, yeah. so now that I've given this lead in, <laughs> what was the experience like for you? <laughs> it was really remarkable because you you kept on asking such interesting questions and I had to revisit my life in ways uh, that one doesn't unless you're writing your memoir, I guess. I mean, that uh, I just have always looked forward. I always kept putting one foot in front of the other and moving on and doing the work. Not that I'm not introspective, I am introspective, but I, to go back, you, you went all the way back to my childhood when I was telling you stories of my stuff, the animals, <laughs> you know, that's quite extraordinary. And then you were quite wonderfully empathetic and sympathetic so that I could even, re, you know, revisit 
not just the successes, but the real, you know, bruising. Um, I don't know if I want to call them failures because there's in a way when you create things, it's, there's almost no such thing. I mean, they may have not been critically successful, or you could have done better on this, 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 and this, but you always learn something. And sometimes you learn most from the things that don't, you know, conventionally succeed and the ones that do. So you were always so open. So I was able to revisit my life, which is a very it's a great lesson. I mean, you gave me that. You know, I think it will be forever grateful to you. I also guess I, you encouraged me to talk about things that I had never talked about publicly. And I felt safe enough with you that I could, and I knew that if I had told you the truth, that you would handle it with the greatest of care. Thank you. And you did. <laughs> Shifting, perhaps, to the world beyond the MacArthur, maybe the world beyond Princeton, how do you think theater can respond to and help with the difficult issues that are facing the country at the moment. Endemic racism, sexism, and what seems to be an increasingly, an increasing tendency to lean toward authoritarianism. Oh, yes. Well, I'm perfect on you to answer that question. <laughs> Given who's in the room here looking at me with so many people here spending their lives and doing their lives engaging in those questions. Um, I can just say, uh, Joseph Rodriguez, who's sitting there as is um, artistic director of Playhouse Creatures um, Theater, um, theater company in New York, and he's doing a legacy season of my plays. And what's been amazing between the two of you, the biography, and then looking back at my body of work, um, is um, looking at just that set of questions, because that's what my body of work is all about. Um, looking at authoritarianism, I mean, I'm right now writing um, the stage adaptation of The Pianist. Um, some of you may know it from the Polanski movie, but um, based on the memoir of a man named Bogor Freshkirman, who was a great pianist in, in Poland, Jewish, who um, survived the Holocaust through luck, the artistic community, and the power of art in his own mind to keep him from complete and utter despair. Um, and um, so I'm dealing with questions of authoritarianism, but just having gone to work on execution of justice with, with Joseph's company, going back to that play of mine from 1985, um, we're dealing with the same issues in this country as we were then. I was looking at a divided city. This was um, a play about the murder of uh, Harvey Milk, the first open with a um, uh, city, city supervisor in San Francisco and, and, and this openly gay uh, um, politician in America. And um, George Moscone, a liberal mayor, reminds me of you know, John Lindsay and you know that whole crowd. And then and, and what was happening there, what the fault lines were in that city fell along the same cultural lines that we're looking at now. It was anti-immigrant, it was anti-gay, um, it uh, was a, a, a war between um, the conservative religious uh, right and, and the more secular open left. Um, and that we see those divisions now looking at that play is, was a very interesting experience. I'd love to hear from Joseph after we're done, but um, I think that when you put out plays that have great specificity to the stories being told and that that has, the stories have embedded in them great social upheaval and political uh, uh, questions of race, gender, uh, questions of uh, hatred of the other. I mean, these themes that keep on coming up through my work, if, if you 
can get those stories out there and get audiences hearing it, listening to it, and then discussing afterwards, then in a way, just by getting that out into um, the ether, change can occur. I'm, I'm reminded, you know, I was thinking about this because you asked me this question recently. I know Gary's, uh, my husband is over here thinking you really must tell the story of the letter you received from having our say. And, and this is this is when I knew that what I was doing mattered. After um, my play, Having Our Say, which is about two African-American sisters, both of 100 years old. Most of you in this room know what I've seen there, they're a brother or whatever. Um, it started at McCarter and then went on to Broadway and the movie and all that. I mean, this is my most, I guess, commercial. It's been done successful. recently in several, in several theaters around the country yeah. this past year. Yeah, I know. Yeah, which is interesting. Um, but they are a remark they were a remarkable uh, uh, duo. And um, when it premiered at McCarter, I got a letter from uh, an audience member, a uh, person matron who said, Dear Miss Man, and I'm going to paraphrase it because sadly I can't find it. Grace, maybe you can help me find it. Um, it was, she said, Dear Miss Smith, thank you for introducing me to the Delaney sisters. I have never known, and I can't remember if she said black person, Negro, because I heard Negro a lot at this time, even in the 90s. As in one of our dear friends, Wendy, <laughs> said to me, Are you going to continue producing all of those Negro plays? <laughs> that was in like 1995. Um, she and I said, Yes, I am. Um, this woman said, um, I have never met a Negro person who didn't work for us. Thank you so much for introducing me to two women who I think could be part of my family or a very or very good. Did you respond to her? Did you write? I did, and I and I God, wish I had that correspondence. Um, I thanked her for her honesty and for uh, how I, I was so. Uh, I said, if there's been that kind of change in you, I can die happy. That's true. So, do you want to? Which roles here? Oh, yes. <laughs> so I want to ask you, Alexis, <laughs> what was the biggest discovery for you? The biggest discovery. There were, there were, I don't know if there was one biggest. I think the most disturbing discovery was the discovery as you revealed to me about your assault when you were being assaulted when you were a teenager. That was certainly the most disturbing discovery. One of the wonderful discoveries was how good an actor you were. <laughs> yes, I mean, and I, and I, Tom Miller is not here tonight. I don't. I think he would, he was uh, doing public relations at McCarter for you, but he told me he, about this film called Saigon: The Year of the Cat, <laughs> which was uh, a May for Thames television film. And as the story was told to me, uh, you went to Thailand with, with Jerry Bannon uh, because he had been cast in the film. And along the way, some actor did not show up. And because of your background and you had acted, the director asked if you would take this part. And she does, Emily does an absolutely magnificent job as the last one of the few Americans left behind uh, after everybody, you know, uh, escaped from, from Saigon, Saigon. Yep. 
and it and you toned it down enough so that you are acting for film as opposed to on the stage but there was an emotional component in your expressions your face was so expressive and your voice was very expressive so this was quite wonderful and uh then the other discovery of course that, we, that we've talked about was my finding your first play at yeah. the university of chicago among her father's papers, Arthur Mann's papers. He had taught at the University of Chicago. He had taught history. He was an excellent historian. And there were all these boxes uh, sitting in front of me, and I picked up a kind of a square flat box that had Amy written on the top of it. And I opened it, and it was an audio tape, or it seemed to be an audio tape anyway. And I had no idea what this was, and so I emailed Emily, and I said, you know, what is, what is this? What is Amy? And you wrote back immediately, you said, that's my play. It was my first play. Oh. And, and I'm sitting here, actually wondering why Joseph Rodriguez, uh, since he's doing a retrospective, has it picked up on this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's very much a I mean for for a person's first play, it's really rather extraordinary because it's well formed. It has it is good solid form. The there are conflicts and it's it's a very actable play. And indeed, I know that because when finally. The University of Chicago Library digitized the tape for us. We could listen to it and, and hear your voice reading all the parts, <laughs> uh, which was quite wonderful. And it, I, I, I actually wrote in biography that you know it's not a documentary play. It's not a theater of testimony. But it relates to your later work because there are the conflicts, there are there emotional relationships, personal relationships that are uh, very well uh, described, uh, dramatized in, in the play. And that's what, to me, has made your theater of testimony so unique. Because, it, yes, your plays are documentary plays, but they have this underpinning of that's theatrical, that's emotional, that contains dramatic conflict as well. I'm so glad you... And, 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 and you, you can see that at the, at the beginning here. In this play. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing thing to have. Uh, yes, I, I wanted my father to understand what I was doing, and I so I sent him that tape. It's so interesting. I, I, I was on a committee on a panel once with what the drama school calls hyphenates. So it was um, director, uh, playwrights, um, playwright actors, playwright designers, and who everyone was talking about whether how they wrote came from what their hyphen it was really about. So James Lapine said, I write because I was originally a designer architect and I see it first. And George Wolfe said, I write as an actor because I was an actor first. And I said the same thing, I write because I'm an actor first. And, um, and Doug Wright said he wrote as a director, because he'd always wanted to be a director. So it's interesting to see what that kind of pattern is. And um, yeah, I write from an actor's point of view. Emily, I think your microphone is on yellow. Oh, you might have to hit the green. You were oh, right on as usual. Oh, thank you. Did you all hear it? Oh, great. Uh, one of the great joys of, of writing this book was learning about you and your plays and also Dr. McCarter and weaving those 
stories together. In, in a way, it's been a great gift that I've been able to write this book the way I wanted to. It's what some people call a traditional biography in the sense that it begins with, it goes back before Emily was born to explorations of her parents' lives. And then it describes your childhood and your early relationships and goes through your girlhood. And then, you know, finally, as you fall in love with the theater at the University of Chicago, well, at the last school uh, of the University of Chicago, that launches more into your career and your relationship with theater. And uh, there are people who, when my agent was taking the book around, who there were people who told him, well, you know, we, we don't necessarily need this, you know, this early part of, of oh, the book. Really? Of, oh, yeah. And I insisted that it had to be there. And it seems to me that any smart reader uh, makes the connection yeah. between what you were uh, as, as a youngster, as a child, and as a, an adolescent, uh, a young woman, and, and how that evolved into the artist and you know the woman you are today. I, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Oh, I learned so much. By reading your book <laughs> in so many ways, Alexis knows more, and she knows she knows more about so many things about me and my life than I do. Um, but also, you know, memory is so faulty. So I went around thinking a whole bunch of things that weren't. <laughs> I liked <laughs> that Alexis was able to correct. <laughs> Remember, I, I thought it was Frank Rich who, and Execution of Justice, and it was Mel Gussab, or vice versa. Or one of them did still life, and the other did. They're both pants, but you know which one, which critic did it? Um, I always blamed Frank Rich, and I think it was Mel. Um, that was one sort of amazing. She kept saying, "No, no, I'm just sending it to you." Understand? And then the other discovery we made in my father's paper that blew my mind. Yes, uh, when I was going through. Emily's father's papers at the University of Chicago. He had been in, in the army, and during the last months of World War II, he was stationed in France and Germany. And about upon doing research as to where his company had gone, largely based on uh, a note he had sent to his wife. He, he had already married your mother by then. And he had written her a note that said, we are somewhere in Germany. And obviously he was not allowed to tell her where, where they were. This was perhaps, you know, March of 1945. And his company was the first, one of the first companies to go into Ordruf which was a subcamp of Buchenwald. And actually, Ordruf was the first concentration camp that the American troops liberated in Germany. And among his papers at the University of Chicago was a horrific photograph of Numerous corpses, emaciated corpses, piled on top of each other. There is no indication of who took this photograph, how he acquired it, but certainly the implication was that he had been among the troops 
that had gone into at least one of these concentration camps and seen the destruction and the human desolation there. He apparently never told anybody in his family about he didn't tell you or your sister or his brother or Arthur's brother, his sister didn't apparently know about it. I suspect he must have told your mother. But this certainly conveyed to me or answered for me questions about why later in life he became so involved with refugee causes and organizations, especially, you know, Holocaust refugee organizations. Absolutely. Yeah. And clearly, uh, though he refused to talk about the war ever, what he did in the war with the family, um, we needed to know what happened. And certainly on the level of questions about the Holocaust, and my mother's family was wiped out in Poland, but um, his family was not. They got out early, and yet it was something that it was a responsibility in our household to, to know deeply about it. And I don't think it's a, at all a coincidence that the first professional you know, production play that I wrote was that Ula was, mm -hmm. was about a Holocaust survivor. Um, that I'm sort of coming full circle with the pianist. <laughs> it's, I, I do look at the world through the lens of someone who understands the Holocaust or who try, has spent my life trying to understand. And of course, that's that's also one of the great rewards, in a way, of writing a biography, discovering things that you you know you had no idea uh, existed before, and uh, they may remain mysteries, but that's that's part of the reward in a in a certain way. Uh, you know, it allows us to ask questions and perhaps dig a little bit more deeply into uh, the lives of the people who, who raised us. You know, what, what have they experienced? And why did they teach me what they taught me? I think is Dorothea telling us to start a Q&A? We, we can't, you know, um, we're coming sort of yeah, shall we open it up and then sure. we can also continue asking each other questions. Sure. Um, if I, if you don't mind sharing a mic and then I can take the other one around. Yeah. So, um, otherwise I'm sure you have more questions for us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, Emily, um, I, I think people would be very interested to hear a little bit about your life in Chicago. And because those were very strong influences for you um, there, and I think that that sure. pushed your, your your life forward in your association. Not only, I mean, you brought tears by, to my eyes when you started talking about the Holocaust and and that you see the world, you know, through those lenses and to try to understand. But then your your understanding of of people of color. Came very much from your childhood in Chicago. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, one of the other key influences in my life was uh, my father's best friend, John Hope Franklin, who was um, professor of uh, well, first interestingly enough, Southern history, uh, of, but then really founded the field of African American history in this country and considered the dean of of, of that field and. Uh, uh, he was the one who brought my father from Smith College, where he was teaching because he believed in the education of women. Uh, said it's time for you to get out of this small town and come uh, and and be with with us at University of Chicago. And he was there with Daniel Borson and a whole bunch of other um, extraordinary professors. So we moved um, because of John Hope, and, and that family was a second family. To um, African American family. Um, and um, my school, I, I, we, 
we were, went through public school in New England, and then we thought we would go to public school in Chicago, and it was very dangerous at that time. I would have been the only white uh, kid in the class. Um, my father knew about the lab school, and so it's the same school where the Obama sent their kids. It's one of the greatest things. God, they didn't listen to me. I screamed and yelled. I wanted to go to Hyde Park High, but they got me to the lab school, which is where I um, had my high school years. It was completely integrated. It's one of the few neighborhoods then in the country, 66 and 70, that um, there were mixed marriages. There was uh, a very progressive community, and um, there, uh, there was a lot of uh, black culture there. And um, I suppose I came of age at a time when we lived three doors down from Elijah Muhammad. I would, the, the school bus stopped in front of Elijah Muhammad's uh, palace where the fruit of Islam were standing guard. And I made it my mission in life to look at these dudes, look them in the eye and say, good morning every morning. <laughs> I finally cracked them. It took about six or eight months before they finally said good morning to me. But I uh, know I was the white devil. Um, and um, so I grew up with that. And then the Blackstone Rangers that became the Black Peace Donation and the Devil's Disciples, those two gangs ran the uh, neighborhood. And basically, to be safe, you had to have um, Black friends with affiliates in those gangs. And everyone says, why didn't you ever pierce your ears? It's because if you were actually friends with black guys, then the rangerettes would come and pull the earrings out of your ears. And so I really wanted that to happen. Um, but it was a great education living in that neighborhood and in those times. And this was a time of uh, the days of rage in SDS. It was the women's movement, it was the black power movement. I became very enamored of the Black Panther Party and at Hampton and that crowd because they, I thought, were doing extraordinary work on the South Side um, of Chicago. And so I, I came of age at a time when the country was going through an enormous series of, of revolutionary activities. And so um, that formed me. And because I had two extraordinary families, for example, the night Martin Luther King was killed, we went out to dinner, as we always did, to us, Thursday night or Friday night, and we talked about it. John Hope, Franklin, and my father. I mean, to have those two extraordinary minds, those two extraordinary historians talking about what was going on in those years with my, I call it my brother John, John Hope and Aurelia's son, um, when we went out, the six of us, it was a seminar of such a high level. Um, I mean, and there were tears and screaming and yelling, and he and I were getting radicalized. My, uh, John and I, or uh, John Hope's son and I were getting radicalized. John Hope was getting radicalized. In fact, father was beginning to turn more conservative. And so the, you know, this is also the anti-war movement. So, I mean, you had all of these things going on, and, and the generational um, warfare was quite extraordinary. But it made me interesting. <laughs> 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 you know, there was a, a teenagers who had to know what was going on in the world because you had these two towering figures saying, back that up. Why do you believe that? Emotion isn't enough. Of course, that was an awful thing to say to me because <laughs> that's all I really had. I didn't have the facts. He was right. I had a lot of emotion. Anyway, this has just been fascinating. And maybe I should know the answer to this, but um, of all the plays you produce here, including your own, is the one that was the most challenging, the most difficult that you dare talk about? <laughs> <laughs> the one that was the most difficult or the one that was 
say challenging or difficult. Mm -hmm. Or do you mean rewarding? No, you mean challenging or difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, well, having said, interestingly enough, was the easiest play for me to write. I wrote it very quickly. And bless the memory of Gloria Foster. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm very honest, it's still alive, but. Uh, it was the hardest rehearsal I have ever gone through in my life. So people can't believe that those two women hated each other. Oh, yeah. Despised each oh. other. And part of it was colorism. That Mary Alice felt that Gloria Foster thought she was better than her because she was lighter. She knew how to set a nice table, and Mary Alice didn't know how to set it up. So it was classes with this it was, it was cast in color. Oh my God, it was just sitting in that room. And Mary Alice hates white people. So this was hot. And I had just been diagnosed recently with MS and I would walk into the room shakily, but MS is also stress-based as you know, I'm sure you recall. <laughs> Um, so it would be such a stressful room that I had to be carried out. I mean, oh, God, that year there was an intern who was like 6'2", Ned Canty, I will, we will we bless his name to this day, and he would carry me to the car, and he'd carry me out of the car, and Gary would take me um, into the house, and it was just like a total freaking nightmare, and yet it was probably the biggest success that um, what would go on in that room would make the hair fall out of your head. It's very hard to... <laughs> I don't think we went into that detail in the book. <laughs> or you did, did you? I can't remember that. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, this has been off and on for the last year and a half or so, um, given all the work that you've done in the theater, um, the state of the American theater right now, oh. since the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's happened in the last two years, there's been a lot of soul searching mm -hmm. um, in the American theater and in um, regional theaters and the way theaters are run and the way theaters are staffed mm -hmm. and, and the work that's put on. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that right now? Do you feel there's a long way to go? Do you feel that we've made progress? Do you feel like there's that so much work to be done? Oh, Grace. Mm. Such a big question. It's such a great question. And I and I knew someone thought of you all these last two years. Yeah, I've written all that. of this stuff coming out of the American Theater and, and a magazine and TCG. Yeah. I've been on all these Zoom uh, conferences yeah. and all of this soul searching. And I don't well, know. I, I know. I, I have such mixed feelings about it because of course I dedicated my life to it. And I made coming to a town like this, which I gave you a slight uh, taste of what it was like when I arrived, but it still runs deep. I mean, basically, Princeton is, you know, the most northern southern town. I mean, it's, it's a very segregated still to this day town, better than it used to be. There's more diversity at the university. There's more diversity in the town. There's, you know. But it's a constant struggle uh, to live a uh, fully uh, uh, easy, diverse life in this town. It's not so hard. It's not as hard in New York as I'll try to help. Okay. So we, I felt that we were able in the McCarter in my day to get the board, the work on the stage, and often the audience 
to be a diverse uh, and well-rounded um, uh, picture of what America is about. And then waxed and waned. It was some years were more successful than others. Mostly, we were able to get African American people to come when the shows were about African American people. I hoped that I would live to see the day before I died when there would be subscribers for all the plays, regardless of one's race or background. But I don't think I will live to see that day. Um, saw a little bit of it, but not enough. Could not keep a staff of color. Ava Carter tried and tried and tried. People would come and they would say to me, Ellen, I, I came for you and I, I just can't stand it. I hope you do better, Shannon. Um, worked on it all my life, as you well know. You were there for so much of it. And it was what I thought was my biggest failure. So that, I mean, the reckoning had to come. I guess I always felt because Kwame Koyama is one of my closest friends, and he was, you know, a British um, African um, artistic director, playwright, just a fabulous guy. He was running Baltimore Center stage. Now he's running the outfit in London. And he would always say, Well, what's the problem? Just do it. And that was my I thought, just do it. And you know, you hire the people who come. But you know what? It goes so deep and it's so unconscious. And so many people of goodwill don't know that how they are behaving actually alienates people. And so in those days, we didn't have diversity training. We didn't have air and all of that. And I don't know yet how successful that's going to be. But we didn't even have all that. I just felt like a one woman band all the time, just making, trying to make things happen. And um, it's very deep. And if you look at the count that had just come out from uh, the Lilies, the Novice Guild, um, Julia Jordan and Marcia uh, uh, Norman would have done this incredible study about women and people of color and how much progress has been made. And, you see the going from the single digits into the double digits. Oh, this is so thrilling. This is so thrilling. Um, and I'm glad that women have not been forgotten, by the way, at all of this, because that's probably my, am I, am I uh, no, rambling? I, no, I don't oh. have a question. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I, would you know, it's sort of addresses this, this issue recently. The author of Slave Play, which was being produced uh, out at the theater out in Los Angeles, took his play out of the season because there, that season had no plays by women in it. And he said, unless you do something about this, you're not going to have my play either. Yeah, and that's a great moment, actually. Yeah. I, and, and what do you know, uh, they promised that the next season would indeed have, you know, plays by, I think, only women, as a matter of fact. So my question to you is, what about this technique? <laughs> well, I love that he did that. And, you know, the, the thing is, to put on plays by and about women and people of color, to me, is a no-brainer. The best work, in my opinion, that I've been reading over the last 30 years is written by women of people of color. I'm sorry. I mean, it's not like you're having to choose between something that has merit and something that doesn't. And yet I don't want to leave my white male friends out in the cold either. I mean, I love the work of Chris Durang and Edward Albee and all that. You know, the, there are so many great guys writing as well. It's just why the balance? Why does it have to be either or? We're all human beings on this earth. We should be trying to put on stage what reflects who we are as, as you know, in all our humanity. And uh, why it has become parsed to this level and having people be antagonistic towards each other on this issue is it's just heartbreaking to me. And I thought we'd be further along than we are in 2022. And maybe that's the answer. Chris, yeah. It's kind of crazy that what you just described still feels 
slightly utopian, <laughs> you know. Um, but but maybe we're on our way, and, and maybe that is, isn't a bad thing. It's common sense, though. Which I know common sense is, is not so common. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but at the same time, I think there um, certainly Me Too and Black Lives Matter have been the hopeful the hopeful um, moments over the last few years, and so. Uh, I, I hope that that will also continue to be reflected and will grow in the theater world. The theater world has a very long way to go. It's so interesting that most people think, oh, the theater is such a progressive place, such a liberal place. In fact, it isn't. Yeah. And it is run, been run by the White Guys for forever. Yeah. Well, as Alexis shows, not for lack of you trying to change it. <laughs> so uh, maybe we can end with that. And thank you for that. And thank you for coming back. And I am a bookseller, so I want to tell you that you can, <laughs> you can buy a book and you can get it signed. Uh, maybe, Alex, if you want to just keep up by the book. And then if Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.